This is Danny from Made of Metal, aka Britain's Strongest Drummer, and the dust has settled on another official Strongman Games World Championships. Congratulations to every strongman and strong woman that made it out there to compete. It was a joy to watch. There were highs, there were lows, there were in betweens. Uh, in this video, we're going to recap almost everything that went down over the course of the weekend. We're going to go through event by event, weight class by weight class peppering in some uh, opinions and commentary throughout, so join me for the journey, why don't you? Okay, so first event was that overhead medley. It was, geez, how many objects? Quite a few. Uh, let's go through them. I'm not going to look at any notes or anything. It was a barbell, it was a dumbbell, it was a yoke, and it was a block. Am I missing something? I don't think I am. Yeah, let's, let's go with that. It's fine. Kicking off. The entire competition, we're going to start with the under 64s. Rhiannon Lovelace and Kate Connolly in the first heat. Uh, absolutely blitzed it. Kate is amazing overhead. Rhiannon, as many of us probably would have predicted, even though I do believe that overhead events aren't necessarily her favourite events, she managed to get through the whole thing, although it did take her two attempts to press that block at the end of the run. Colleen Mulcahy manages to press the block after a couple of attempts, the cleans from the ground to the shoulder looked really efficient and impressive, but Hannah Coldiron is the first athlete in the under 64 class to press the block first time. And due to some sort of miscommunication with, I believe, the yoke height, Charlotte Hayden had to go through the first event by herself. So props for managing to do that. That couldn't have been easy with all that pressure. Camilla Fulgoniolo made an immediate impact on the competition, taking the lead in this event and walking away eventually with the win. Holly McRae also did really well, although the cleans on that block, it almost made it seem like she was a bit more unfamiliar with that particular implement, but she managed to press it in the end. And Panda had a narrow escape, almost dropping the block on her face. It was a scary moment to watch. I can't imagine what it was like actually being under it, but luckily she walked away okay. So in the under 73 kilogram weight class, the anchor bottomed yoke seemed to be causing a lot of trouble for many of the athletes. There were quite a few that weren't able to actually press it. And it turns out after the fact that the yoke itself may have been loaded slightly heavier, which could possibly explain why so many athletes struggled with it. Alicia Donner attacked the yoke with intent. She was cycling between split jerks and push presses and we did see a variety of techniques across the weight classes with varying degrees of success when it came to this yoke press. Some were trying to blast it, some were split jerking it, some were push pressing it but like I say it took a long while for anyone in the under 73 kilogram class to actually successfully press this yoke. And the two athletes that successfully pressed the yoke were Lauren Ryder and Nancy Johnson. Lauren Ryder actually managed to move on and press the block for the event win. Jessica Mitchell was really unlucky, almost managed to lock out the yoke, but managed to drop it behind her. So in the whole class, there were only two athletes that managed to press the yoke, and one athlete managed to press the block. Moving on, let's go to the men in the under 80 kilogram class. The big news going in was Ben Donan made weight for the competition. There were a few, myself included, that were skeptical, Based on what happened earlier in the year with the Arnold and the OSG European Championships as to whether he would be able to make weight and if he did make weight, would he be competitive? But as soon as I learned that he did make weight, I was thrilled that we had the defending under 80 kilogram, world's strongest man defending that title. I'm sure a lot of the lads in that class were pleased to have the chance to compete against him as well. But this was another weight class where the yoke proved to be insurmountable for a lot of the athletes. Richie Stout couldn't quite manage the yoke and neither could Ben Dona. And that kind of goes back to how was he feeling on that first day after that weight cut? Because from what I understand, it was quite a big weight cut. We had Finley Mercer making his World Championships debut. He 
is a unique athlete. We know we've seen some of the things that he's done in the past. And on this event, he got to the dumbbell, didn't manage to press the first attempt, let it rest on his shoulder and kept going from the shoulder, which I think was potentially an error. I think it may have served him a bit better to just put the dumbbell down on the floor, reset, recompose and go for it again. So seeing that, I wondered what Finley Mercer we'd see over the duration of the weekend. Mason Cup battled and beat the yoke, pressed it out for some valuable points. And Kyle Scott, the only note I had written down was that barbell was sex. Dean McVie came out and did what he needed to do, but it seemed like, were we gonna have anyone able to press this block, which made Chris Harper's OSG World's debut all the more incredible. He was the only athlete out of 40 plus that managed to press the block, winning his first OSG event at his debut competition. Now, I did find out a little bit later on that the weight of the block was something around 90% of the world record. So that would explain why so many athletes had such a tricky time with it. And again, just goes to show what an athlete Chris Harper is and would prove to be throughout the weekend. On to the under 90s and Josh Lancaster and Ollie Clark are first out. Josh Lancaster immediately trips over the barbell before the event has begun. That's kind of become a bit of a thing for him, but both of them managed to get through the first two implements, but got stuck on the yoke. Although Josh gave it a couple of really good goes, a uh, nice deep split, which he's, he's known for doing. We've seen him do it at the Chaos Classic, it was. Uh, on that max log. Nearly got it, it was just, I guess the, the swinging just couldn't stabilize it and lock it out. Gav McNamee steps up and prior to the competition, he was posting on social media about troubles with his wrist. So I was intrigued uh, to see what sort of shape Gav would be in coming into this pressing medley. He managed to lock out the dumbbell, although it took a little bit more effort than I'm sure he would have liked. Naramu talking about split jerks on that yoke with varying levels of success, absolutely nailed it, smashed it, it looked textbook. Aiden Howell is very enthusiastic on the yoke, trying to press that up, and actually manages to tip it over and spill some of the plates. Shane Germain, he, the log Don, I think, I, I wonder how much pressure he felt going into this, because we've all seen his lifts on social media. We know that he knows his onions, so to speak, so, I would have thought that he would be hoping to do really, really well on this event. He stumbles on that first barbell, absolutely smashes the dumbbell and can't quite manage the yoke, which I know would have been really disappointing for him. He came really close, momentarily locked it out, but not long enough to get that down signal, unfortunately. We have a malfunction at the junction for Tyler Davis. He doesn't get given the yoke press, but is for some reason allowed to proceed to the block and actually attempt a press before being told to go back to the yoke. I'm not entirely sure what happened there, why the ref allowed Tyler to get as far as handling the block and trying to press it. Um, but these yokes are just murdering everyone. So you know they're gonna be returning to OSG in 2025, so be prepared for that. And just when it seems that no one in the under 90 kilogram class is gonna be able to finish this event, Lee Shaw comes up, literally I wrote down in my notebook, no one's gonna press this block. Lee Shaw came out, pressed it, made it look easy, and then Derek Owens came out, put on an absolute clinic, and took the event win in this overhead event. So we move on to the sticks and stone carry and go back to the under 64s. It was a frame into a stone dinny sort of handle carry. I think the frame was 20, 50 foot and the stones were 25 foot. Alessandra Minaglio was out fairly early on due to how she performed in the overhead event, but she is another athlete that was speaking of injury going in. So I think she was 
kind of prepared for that and she managed to do really well. She uh, was one of the first athletes to actually complete the event despite, I think I saw her on social media again, say uh, she hated the stone. So great effort from Alessandra. Meg Latter came alive on this event, was absolutely warp speed on the frame carry, managed to finish the stones with no drops in a time of 33.98 seconds, but we were only gonna get faster from there. Tony Varecchia finished in a time of 32.97 seconds and we had a drag race between Kate Connolly and Colleen Mulcahy. Colleen took the win with 32.5 seconds in that particular race. It was uh, incredible to see. Unfortunately, it seemed like Holly McRae's grip was suffering on that frame. It did look a, a bit of a tricky implement to get a hold of, but Rhiannon came in and took the event win with a time of 31 seconds, 0.34. In the under 73 kilogram weight class, Alicia Donner and Sherry Zimmerman were the first two athletes with real standout performances. Alicia finishing the course in 34.91 seconds. But it was at this point in the competition that I started to wonder whether the weights potentially needed to be tweaked a little bit for the under 73s because a lot of athletes were actually struggling to just move the frame, let alone get to the stones. There were some that didn't manage to budge the frame at all and I found in the under 73 class particularly that seemed to be the class where athletes were suffering the most and not being able to complete events. I think that's fair to say. However Laura de Burt Romilly was one of the few that managed to actually finish the event, the other two being Zimmerman and Donna. Evelyn Valdez left it all out there, nearly managed to finish, it was just the effort was, was incredible to see. It was a great effort, even though it fell slightly short, unfortunately. And we had an interesting technique from Nancy Johnson on the stones, who actually picked the stones up as if it were, as you, you would pick up the dinghy stones for a static lift. So straddling the stones, picking them up, and then trying to walk, which it looked incredible. I don't think it was the most efficient way to do it, but, Nancy still managed to get 11 feet or, or so uh, with that method. So, you know, uh, it's incredible effort. In the under 80 kilogram weight class, Patrick Harris was like a bat out of hell on the frame, but didn't quite manage to carry the stones the full distance. The first athlete to do so was Stephen Coyne. There were actually quite a few under 80 kilogram athletes that did manage to finish this event, which was nice to see. Ross Manoray's overshot the finish line with the frame and nearly took out the production table, which is something that, you know, we love to see. And we had Sonny Nash, Kyle Scott, Ben Donan and Dylan Thompson all in the same heat. Kyle was quickest on the frame, but Dylan Thompson managed to take the heat win on the stones. Carl Sherry put on a masterclass and gave us our first sub 30 second finish with a time of 29.4 seconds. Then the final heat for the under 80s was Dean McVie, Rich Panganaban, Josh Kovalevsky and Chris Harper. Now Chris Harper was absolutely flying until a drop on the stones allowed Josh Kovalevsky to just creep ahead, beating Chris by about half a second. Uh, for the under 90 kilogram weight class, I had to tap out of the live stream, I'm afraid to say. I had been watching from 3pm and we got to about midnight UK time and the under 90s hadn't set up for the sticks and stone event yet so I had to catch up the morning after and I woke up to see Gav McNamee staking a claim for being the fastest lightweight on the planet with a time of 22.06 seconds which is just insane and a good margin in front of second place. Kicking off day two, we had the deadlift medley. It was five barbells getting increasingly heavier. One rep on each barbell, fastest time wins. In the under 64 kilogram class, unfortunately, this is where Panda did suffer an injury. Watching, it looked as though she passed out because of the pressure of the suit, but later found out that it was a, a hamstring injury that I think she was nursing coming into the competition. So unfortunately, that meant she had to pull out. So I wish her a speedy recovery and I'm looking forward to seeing her in competition soon enough. 
Taylor Woods is the first athlete to complete all five bars in the under 64 kilogram weight class. That final bar looked as though it took about 15 seconds to lock out. She really, really stuck with it. And those 15 seconds must have felt like 15 minutes. It must have been excruciating, but she got it. Well done. Camilla Folgagnolo put on another great event performance in this, managing to pull all five bars in 33 seconds. But as many of us probably expected going in, Rihanna Lovelace absolutely demolished this event as she always does, pulling all five bars in 26.27 seconds. Just check that. I haven't got the point, but 26 seconds thereabouts. In the under 73 kilogram weight class, there wasn't an athlete that managed to pull all five bars. Although Nancy Johnson made the first four look very smooth, although she was just pipped by Sherry Zimmerman, who was ever so slightly faster and took the event win. So of the whole class, only three athletes managed to pull four barbells, Bobby Sundberg being the third, which again made me wonder about the weights. I don't compete in the class. I would like to hear from the athletes themselves what they thought of the weights. And it's one of the great debates in Strongman. How many people have to finish for an event to be deemed too easy? And how few need to finish before it's deemed too tough? I, 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 I don't know, but I'd be interested in hearing some opinions. Moving on to the under 80 kilogram weight class and Sonny Nash had a good run. He really, really struggled to lock out that 635 pound bar. Just couldn't manage to get that final inch, which was a real shame. Jason Teitelbaum is the first athlete to actually make it to that fifth bar, but unfortunately he's unable to lock it out. And this was the first event where I really noticed a change in Finley Mercer as an athlete. He is an incredibly strong deadlifter and he played this ladder to perfection. He raced through the first three bars and not three months ago, I would have expected him to strap into the fourth bar, wrench it off the floor, possibly not get it, and then just stay attached to the bar, keep pulling, keep pulling, wear himself out. But what he did was he got to that fourth bar and he stopped, he paused. It must have been 20, 25 seconds. He was almost pacing. And then when it was time, strapped in, pulled that bar, did exactly what he needed to do just before the time ran out. And it was valuable for him. It got him fourth place in this event. Rich Pang Anavan gave it everything and managed to lock out that fifth bar, but it cost him dearly. An injury, I believe it was a bicep injury. Don't quote me on that. Uh, forced him to pull out the remainder of the competition, which is a real shame because it's absolutely one of the favourites to make it to that podium at the end of the competition. So yeah, real shame. But on day two of this competition, Ben Donan came in looking like a different athlete. He loves a deadlift ladder and he loved this deadlift ladder. He managed all five bars in a time of 29.76 seconds, which is just incredible. Chris Harper unfortunately wasn't so lucky on this event in trying to lock out the fourth barbell he actually took a tumble backwards but he seemed to be okay for the rest of the day and Dean McVie got a little bit of redemption from what happened in OSG 2021 where there was quite a questionable referee call there were no mistakes on Dean's part on this occasion and in the under 90 kilogram weight class Shane Germain flew through those first four bars in a very decent time. I think he was hoping to make up for what he felt was a disappointing day one. And speaking of disappointing day ones, Nick O'Hare, who had a terrible time on the frame and the sticks and stone carry, came to this deadlift ladder hungry. And he was the first athlete in the class to lock out all five bars. Ollie Clark looked very confident on those first three bars, but unfortunately the fourth took him out, who didn't look confident uh, to, to me anyway, Naramu looked very deliberate in his setup to every deadlift. Every pull that he managed to successfully lock out was smooth and powerful. He just seemed to be approaching each bar quite deliberately and taking a bit more time than some of the other athletes to actually set up 
and pull it off the floor. But someone who did not hang around on this deadlift ladder was the event winner, Gav McNamee. The first three bars looking like warm-ups and the fifth bar, that was one of the most powerful deadlifts outside of Rhiannon's in the under 64 kilogram class. It was incredible. Then we move on to the Go Ruck Survival Challenge. This was carrying a stone-shaped sandbag, loading it into a sled, running back, picking up a tombstone-shaped sandbag, running, loading that into a sled, and then dragging the sled back across the track until the front crossed the finish line, all while the athletes are wearing a weighted backpack. And in the under 64 kilogram class, Charlie Robinson was out early, but managed to set a decent pace for the rest of the athletes to chase. Katie Carlisle with a great save to manage to win her heat despite dropping that tombstone sandbag. Meg Latter and Alessandra Managlio were pretty tight in their heat. Alessandra was very quick with the loading, but Meg managed to sneak the win in that heat on the drag. And that seemed to be a running theme throughout this event. It didn't matter who was the fastest to actually load the implements into the sled. It all came down. We saw many athletes who were very quick loading the sled that lost their heat on the drag. So that made this, I, I would say this was one of the most fun, fun events to watch over the course of the weekend. And that bore out in the final heat. We had Kate Connolly, Taylor Woods, Camilla Fogagnolo, and Rhiannon Lovelace. Rhiannon was so quick with the loading, but was just pipped uh, when it came to the sled drag. And in this event, with a time of 33 seconds, the overall event win went to racer Vogler. I really hope I said that name even remotely correctly. My apologies. In the under 73 kilogram weight class, it was immediately clear that the athletes were faring a lot better on this event. We had a lot more finishers across the board. And again, just proving that a quick carry did not mean you'd win your heat. Bobby Sundberg was absolutely flying with the loading, but on the drag back, Kim Scott just managed to sneak ahead. But Jessica Mitchell had a flawless run, managing to complete the event in 35 seconds. This was an event where Chloe Brennan really came alive. We know she loves a moving event. She was pushed by the other women in her heat, but managed to, to take the win in that heat by a good couple of seconds. In the under 80 kilogram weight class, this was the event where everybody needed to lay it on the line to make it to that final day. Unfortunately, this year, Sonny Nash fell slightly short, but I'm looking forward to seeing him coming back and climbing up that leaderboard in the years to come. Finley Mercer absolutely flew on the loading for this event. This was the one where he needed to be that full Tasmanian devil, really turn up the intensity, and he did good enough to take fourth overall. That was closely followed by Anthony Martin. By There was a two second gap. Uh, Finley ended up fourth and Anthony Martin landed down in ninth on this event, which just goes to show how tight the margins were. It was really, really fun to watch. Also an outstanding effort from Kyle Scott managing to finish the event in 35 seconds, taking third place. First and second were Ben Donan and Chris Harper, respectively. They were neck and neck all throughout the event, but Donan just managed to get that sled across the line just before Chris Harper. In the under 90 kilogram weight class, Andrew Hayners came out a ball of fire and took the lead early and managed to hold on to it for a decent amount of time. Nick Myers and Aidan Howell actually tied, according to strength results this is, actually tied with the exact same time on this event, which is rare, it's not something you see all the time. Ollie Clark was unfortunate to stumble just with the last foot or so, as was Derek Owens. I'm not entirely sure what was going through Derek Owens' mind when he slipped, but rather than get up and carry on dragging the sled, he almost seemed he was trying to drag the sled across the floor. As I speak, I am remembering that, of course, he was wearing a, a backpack that I think weighed around 35, 40 kilograms, so I suppose it's not like he could just spring straight up, but yeah, that was, at the time, uh, potentially a devastating result for Derek Owens. And on the final day, we kick off with the bag toss. It is a series of six bags that are thrown over a crossbar that I believe is around about four meters 
off the floor. Great showing from Holly McRae on this, securing valuable points. And I'd say valuable because it seemed quite a few athletes got to that 30 pound throwing bag and really struggled. It seemed with a lot, once the momentum and the power had gone, that was it, it was done. In the final heat, we had Rihanna Lovelace against Camilla Folgignolo. Uh, absolute clinic put on by Rhiannon, no mistakes whatsoever. Camilla was ever so slightly behind, but still managed to take second place in this event. And it's for this event on the live stream that Panda stepped into the commentary seat and provided some much needed stakes and context for the athletes that were competing in this final. Obviously, Panda has a great knowledge of this weight class. It's the class that she competes in. So it was great as a viewer to get some of that context. Up until this competition, I didn't know about the history between Camilla and Rhiannon and the, the sort of overseas rivalry, long distance rivalry. I, I believe this was one of the first times they came face to face in a competition. And it was through the commentary that Panda provided that those little missing pieces of the puzzle uh, fit into place and just made the whole experience much more enjoyable. It was a similar story uh, over the past day or two in the competition. Dan Ashcroft, he stepped up to the commentary table a couple of times and it was a it was just really good hearing about the history of some of these athletes. Um, the commentary team that were on, on the stream for the majority of the very long weekend did a fantastic job, but I feel like it would have been helpful if they were made aware, certainly on the first day of last year's podium, who were the returning champions, who were the, the returning finalists, because I distinctly remember in the overhead medley, Tyler Davis was introduced. He is, was the defending under 90 kilogram champion, but he wasn't introduced as such. He was introduced in lane, whatever, Tyler Davis, not Tyler Davis defending champion, which again, for, a, for someone watching for the first time, that would make you think, ah, that's someone I need to look out for. Um, so hopefully... OSG in years to come take that on board and just draft in people that are a bit more specialist in in some of the other weight classes just just to add that that color to the to the viewing experience apologies for the little run there in the under 73 kilogram weight class Megan Hogg got a very quick first five bags couldn't quite manage that sixth despite a couple of very close calls no close calls from laura o'connor butler who managed all six with no mistakes sherry zimmerman lays it down with a very confident run all six bags in a time of 27.06 seconds and tremendous save from jessica mitchell who missed that sixth bag on the first attempt but managed to get it on the second in the under 80 kilogram weight class we had some of those unique Finley Mercer, strong man, Tekkers. He was, while he was going through the event, dropping down to one knee, which is something that I've never seen before. Not sure we'll see it again. He managed three bags. Kyle Scott misfires the fourth bag, but gets it eventually after a couple of goes, and then manages to get that fifth bag for some very, very valuable points. And Dylan Thompson stepped up. He was the only under 80 kilogram athlete to get all six bags. And to my great shame, I would say that Dylan Thompson was kind of flying under my radar over the course of the weekend. If you look back at his placing across all of the events, he was kind of fifth, sixth, but this was a tremendous event to come alive and take a valuable event win. Josh Kovalevsky was absolutely on fire until the final bag. We had a similar story from Dean McVie, Chris Harper, Ben Donan. It's heartbreaking when you see these athletes of this caliber hit that wall and, and just not, not able to, to find that power anymore. But still, all to play for. Now, in the under 90 kilogram weight class, things got a little bit spicy. After being told that he didn't make the cut for the final day, Derek Owens was there spectating when he and some of us watching at home noticed that one of the other weight classes had 11 athletes in the final as opposed to 10. 
With that in mind, a last minute appeal was put in on behalf of Derek Owens and he was thrust back into the competition with five minutes notice. For this bag toss event, he came out wearing jeans and boots looking casual as you like and he absolutely demolished this event. We saw Tommy Lavelle a couple of years ago do this run in the under 80 kilogram class in 16 some seconds. Derek Owens in the weight class above managed to do this six bag run in 17.57 seconds in casual clothes. Someone pointed out there was a pocket knife hanging off his belt. Absolutely incredible and kept my podium predictions alive. Andrew Haynes also put on a show getting all six bags. He was actually the other athlete in that head-to-head -head with Tommy Lavelle back in 2021 and it's clear that Andrew Haynes has not missed a step. He and Derek Owens were the only two athletes remaining to get all six bags over that bar. Still stones to go. So the final event for the official Strongman Games World Championships 2023 was the stone run. Six stones loaded to platforms. The platforms descend in height as the stones increase in weight. And if we look at the under 64 kilogram weight class, Rhiannon Lovelace already had the championship sewn up in the bag, but it was all to play for for the other ladies in this class. And we had a tremendous run from Holly McRae, first athlete to complete all six stones in the under 64 kilogram weight class. Meg Latter also managed to load all six stones onto the platforms, although I believe the sixth stone was just out of time, which must be gutting, but kudos to them for actually getting it up there and loading it on the platform regardless. In the final head-to-head -head in the 64 kilogram weight class, Rihanna Lovelace was up against Camilla Fogagnolo. A tacky malfunction meant that Rihanna did not take the win in the heat. Camilla actually took the win and Rihanna, I think, ended up second on the stone run. Uh, I hope I got that right. But as I said earlier, with the, with the points advantage, the championship was in the bag. So your under 64 kilogram Podium for the 2023 games in third place, Tony Varakia. In second place, Camilla Folgagnolo. And in first place, Rihanna Lovelace. In the under 73 kilogram weight class, Bobby Sundberg was really unlucky to not be able to load that sixth stone. The first athlete to do so in that class was Jessica Mitchell. But Nancy Johnson, one motioning the first three stones, very confident run taking the event win. And that makes your under 73 kilogram OSG 2023 podium as follows. In third place, Chloe Brennan. Second place, Jessica Mitchell. And first place, Nancy Johnson. In the under 80 kilogram weight class, Finley Mercer had a solid run, but probably rested a little bit more than he needed to on that last stone before he managed to load it. Kyle Scott, one motion, the first four stones and managed to get those last two up, taking an event win at the official Strongman Games World Championships in his debut. Incredible competition from Kyle Scott. He ended up fourth overall. Dylan Thompson edges out Ben Donan, who is unable to load that final stone, which gives Dylan Thompson a place on that podium. Chris Harper, a world record stone lifter, has an amazing run. It's not quite as quick as Kyle, but it's good enough. Your under 80 kilogram podium for the OSG 2023 World Championships is in third place, Dylan Thompson. Second place, Josh Kovalevsky. And in first place, his debut, Chris Harper. In the under 90 kilogram weight class, the stones are an utter bloodbath. Only one athlete manages to complete the stone run. That is Derek Owens. That makes it three event wins out of six for Derek. Two of those event wins come on a day that he didn't think he was competing. Tyler Davis took second place in the stone run, which gave him second place on the podium. And Tyler Davis, again, as with Dylan Thompson, someone that sort of flew under my radar, but it's just that consistency 
You hear it all the time in Strongman. It's not about excelling in one event. It's about being good at all of the events. And Tyler Davis is certainly testament to that. So your under 90 kilogram podium for the OSG 2023 World Championships in third place, Derek Owens. Second place, Tyler Davis. And in first place, Grease Lightning, Gav McNamee. So there we go. I think that just about covers what happened at the official Strongman Games 2023. So one of the things that I alluded to earlier, certainly in respect to that first day, was the live stream is very, very long. I can't imagine what it's like being an athlete out there. But as a viewer, like I say, I had to tap out just before the under 90 kilogram men got to that sticks and stone frame and stone carry. So what can be done? I have seen people talk about halving the number of athletes that make it to the finals. I don't think that would happen. I thought what could work is keep the same number of athletes but have two weekends of competition. In the first weekend, have the there's 12 weight classes so in the first weekend have the under 64s under 73s and over 50 women under 80 kilogram men under 90 kilogram men over 50 men and then the following weekend you can have the under 105s the opens and the masters 40s for the men and the under 82s opens and over 40 masters uh, for the women now you can have the same events you can have the same weights uh, you can have the same venue uh, in terms of subscribers to officialstrongman.com. It doesn't mean an extra subscription or whatever. Athletes can still fly out if they want to stay on for, for the weekend after to spectate or vice versa. Can be done. I think that's probably more realistic than expecting Official Strongman to just essentially half their income in terms of athletes. What do you think about the live stream? How do you think, how do you, what, what changes do you think could be made to the official Strongman Games to make them friendlier on the viewers and the athletes? Because I think I worked out that between the first and second events on that first day, it was something about, something like six hours between, you know, when one weight class went and, and went again. That's a, that's a lot of downtime. So potentially having the competition split into two consecutive weekends, that might, might be better. I don't know. I would say the future of Strongman in the UK is looking pretty darn strong. Finley Mercer, Sonny Nash, Patrick Harris, Kyle Scott, Chris Harper, <laughs> all went out for their first ever OSGs and all absolutely smashed it. Like I say, those that didn't make the final this year, I can totally see them coming back stronger and stronger. For Chris Harper to win World's Strongest Man in his first barely two years of competing in Strongman, that's incredible. Kyle Scott is just getting exponentially better. Finley Mercer is learning all the time as well. Yeah, yeah, things things are looking good for for lightweight strongman in the UK, certainly on the on the lightweight men's side of thing. On the women's side, I did see on social media Rhiannon sort of alluding to the fact that she may be retiring imminently. I know she said that there's a world record that she wants to tick off first, but potentially might think about stepping back from competition after that. I have absolutely no business in trying to influence what Rihanna may or may not do, but I am a big wrestling fan. I'm a big WWE fan, and there's the whole passing of the torch. Um, when you when you when you leave as a wrestler, the 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 tradition is to go out on your back and and pass the torch to to the younger talent, and were Rhiannon to step back whenever t tomorrow, there would be one of those debates that will rage for the rest of time whenever there is a, a young, up-and-coming, under-64-kilogram strong woman. 
could she have beaten Rhiannon? And I mean, that could be one of the great debates that we have for a very long time. Will we see it? Will we see it happen? I don't know. I, I just, yeah, it's one of those what if things. I mean, what 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 do you think? I mean, obviously, we're we're not telling Rhiannon what to do, but I'd be interested to hear your points of view. And podiums. Let's let's talk about podiums. So I made a huge song and dance last year, twenty twenty two. I predicted the under 80 kilogram men podium, third, second, first, in order, I got it, 100%. So maybe I was a bit cocky this year, or maybe I just didn't know what I was talking about. Not anywhere near as successful on the podium predictions this time, although uh, I did predict Rhiannon to win, that, that, was, a, that was a score. Uh, I predicted Josh Kovalevsky to make, well, I, I said third place. Uh, he actually managed second, congratulations. And in the under 90s, I did predict Derek for second and he came third. I will admit that I overlooked Gav McNamee, but as far as I was aware, he was injured. He had that wrist issue. I didn't know how much that was gonna play a part in his performance over the course of the weekend, as it turned out it didn't really make a difference whatsoever. So that's on me. Same with Tyler Davis as well. Uh, like I say, Tyler Davis, just consistent. Consistent and that will get you on the podium. So, you know, the, the podium predictions were all made in in fun anyway. And I, I've never had so much fun just being wrong. So I think that's gonna just about do it for this Official Strongman Games 2023 World Championships recap. What did you enjoy about the competition? Was there anything you didn't enjoy? What do you think about the weight selections, the events? Uh, leave a comment below. I will be back very soon with another video. I did say I was going to try and do some sort of uh, Strongman highlights of 2023 video. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, I've been Danny from Made of Metal, aka Britain's Strongest Drummer. If you enjoyed the video, please like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you soon.